I am about to introduce to you author and screenwriter Eric Bork, and we're going to be talking about this book right here, and I got to read the title. It is called The Idea, The Seven Elements of a Viable Story for Screen, Stage, and Fiction, and I had told him that I thought this was perfect timing because of all of us who are going to participate in NaNoWriMo, and I am. I'm going to write a book. I already know what it's going to be about. And I want to see what happens between Thursday, which is November 1st, and November 30th. And I tried last year and I failed. So I'm going to try it again. So everyone, here is Eric to help us with our ideas. Hi, everyone. I am so excited today because I am speaking with author and screenwriter Eric Bork. And he is well known for the two Emmys and two Golden Globe Awards that he won for Band of Brothers and From the Earth to the Moon. And thank you so much for talking with me again. My pleasure. Great to be back with you, Michelle. Yeah. I mean, your newest book is called The Idea, The Seven Elements of a Viable Story for Screen, Stage, and Fiction, which is quite a quite a title. <laughs> <laughs> but Thank I you. love this book so much. It, I, I like, you know, it took me a couple of hours and I read the whole thing straight through. And it was so good. Um, I do think that it's for any kind of writing that you do, but you do have a tendency to speak to the screenwriters. So, you know, yes. do you think that, yeah, that you speak to the screenwriters? Well, that is my primary audience and that's my uh, background. But, yeah, it's, you know, it's not so much about screenwriting, um, it's not about the, the writing process so much as it is what makes a viable idea, hence the title, what makes a story concept something that could be marketable um, based on my years of, you know, both working in Hollywood and having my agents and managers shoot down my ideas, you know, most <laughs> of the time before, you know, they wouldn't even send them out, which is what happens commonly. You know, representatives of writers want you to run your ideas past them before you commit to anything because they know that they can't do much with most ideas, uh, that there are certain elements that a winning idea tends to have that writers may not be that conscious of. And I've been really made more aware of that in the last 10 years since I've been teaching screenwriting and mentoring writers all, all over the world and, you know, hundreds and probably thousands of scripts that I've read. And I find that most of my notes on scripts, the most important, biggest notes, are notes that I would have had on the original idea if they pitched it to me, and I probably, like a manager or agent, would try to talk them out of the idea or, or find a different way to approach it so that it would have, you know, the elements that I've kind of over time figured out viable ideas have. And I think those are the same elements in, you know, certainly commercial fiction, the kind of fiction that might be translatable to a movie, you know, bestseller type fiction, Maybe literary fiction, you could say there's some exceptions there if you're going for the kind of more niche or experimental uh, approach. Same with, like, maybe European art cinema. But for most of us who are looking to try to reach a mass audience, I think these characteristics, I could say, that a great story idea has are pretty universal. You know, and I was as I was reading it, I was thinking about, you know, as for authors, right, for all the authors out there, when they, like, if they want to write a book now, they can just write the book, and they can sell it on Amazon. I mean, really. I mean, <laughs> if you want to write a book nowadays, it's pretty easy to just do that on your own. You can self-publish, and it can be out there in the world. But for screenwriters, it is so difficult. It is, it's not like you can just go and publish a screenplay. Like, you just can't. You know, and when I got done with your book, I was like, wow, it has got to be the hardest job. It has to be the hardest job in the whole world to be a screenwriter. <laughs> I don't know if I can go that far, but um, you know, the thing about self-publishing, I mean, you can self-publish a book, but can you get millions of strangers wow. to read it and love it? That's that's the key. So right. it's great that we now have the ability. I mean, anybody can obviously write a screenplay too, uh, just like you can self-publish a book. But to get an audience of strangers to pay money to consume your work, which I think is a dream for most of us, uh, that's where these criteria come in. Yes. Yeah, and that that's why, you know, like you use so many good examples of movies that we all know. And what I think about it is like when you break it down, I'm like, wow, all I did was go see that movie and love it. I didn't even realize why I loved it so much. But, you know, then when you break it down, it's like, oh, that's why I loved Like you don't even realize why you love the movies you do. 
Well, that's what makes writing so challenging, I think, is that, is that but yeah, the movies that we love or TV shows, novels, whatever, do it in a way that seems effortless. We get caught up in the story, get emotionally invested, which is what most of these elements are really about. It's how do you get, you know, millions of strangers to emotionally invest in your characters and story and stay invested until the end? You know, we're so used to it being done well by professionals whose work we see that we don't necessarily realize how much hard work goes into that, and we don't realize that, that those things aren't a given until we start reading scripts by, you know, people that are trying to break in and see that, oh, yeah, I'm, you know, all these things aren't happening in these scripts or in these manuscripts. Why not? And so I just sort of made it my business to try to kind of codify what are those elements and the elements, some of them may seem obvious at first glance, but what I really get into in the book is why it's challenging and how there are all these ways you can go wrong in trying to achieve these different things with any particular piece of work. Yeah. And, I, you know, I love reading screenplays. So sometimes if I love the movie, I'll go and read the screenplay. And to me, it's amazing, like, how, sh- like how little words are used for when you, if you watch the movie, anyone out there, like if you watch a movie and you go read the screenplay, you can almost do it simultaneously if you're watching it on your computer. And you'll see how little words are used for the action that's going on in the movie. <laughs> right? Yeah, that's true. And, yeah, I mean, like, because screenwriting is such the getting it down to the amount of, you know, like minimum amount of words to describe the action that takes place which I think is the key. I mean, that's part of it too, right, is to get it those words so perfect. Well, I don't really get into that so much in the book because that's more screenwriting yeah, stuff. That's and my, whole, my whole thing is most screenwriting books focus on scene writing and story structure and, yeah. and the business and a lot of these other very important things. And my, my main point is that that stuff all matters, but not nearly as much as having an idea – that has a chance in the first place, and most writers don't realize that, and they jump too quickly into that writing process Mm -hmm. without an idea that is really solid. It's not easy. It's like the heavy lifting of the whole process is working the idea, and it can take a long time and a lot of different ideas to find one that's really worth the six months to a year that we tend to invest in something. Right. Okay, well, let's let's talk about the seven of them, because I really love that um, that the the letters spell out problem, okay? Yeah. And so it's punishing, relatable, original, believable, life altering, entertaining, and meaningful. So, Correct. And when I was going back over that list, I was thinking about that even with books. Like, wow, I never even thought about it in those words. Like, it's so perfect, and each chapter really goes into each one of those. Yeah, I use problem because my view is that every story at its heart is about a problem, a problem that needs solved. And when you pitch an idea to, to a professional, whether it's a log line or a brief query, what you really should be pitching and what they're really looking for is what is the problem at the center of this story? Why is the problem really difficult? Why is it going to be compelling and entertaining to watch? Why are we going to care? Why is it going to feel like something we haven't quite seen before, but it all makes sense and adds up and feels believable and maybe even has something meaningful behind it? But a lot of what they're looking at is how is it really hard? How is the main character kind of in a punishing situation where they're overmatched by whatever that problem is? So that even though they're actively trying to solve it for the whole story, they're not going to be able to until the very, very end if at all, but usually, you know, most happy, most movies have happy endings. So um, it's not <laughs> like that people are consciously running it through those seven terms that I came up with. It's that those are the language of, you know, when you're, when you're evaluating an idea for a movie, TV show, you know, play, musical, whatever it is, uh, novel, those are kind of the things that we all are, are needing it to be, even if we're not conscious of it or not. So I'm trying to bring it into the conscious mind for writers to, to go, okay, here's the high bar that is set for anything I write. And for myself as well, I'm, I'm a writer and I, you know, use the same criteria with my own stuff. And it's not easy to do all of that and do it really well and convincingly, but that's why it's not easy to be really successful, you know, at this for, for, for all of us, it's, you know, it's a challenging field. 
Yeah, I, you know, and like I said, I love the stories that you tell in this book with the different movies because I see a lot of movies. And, you know, when I thought about it, like the main character, you don't even realize that that's what they're going through, that they're going through a struggle. But when I was reading some of the log lines that you gave, I was like, oh, right. Right, they're going like you know. <laughs> I think it's so subtle, not always subtle, but sometimes it's very subtle. Their struggle, and then what they're achieving. Of course, we always want to see them overcome, right? Yeah. You know, by the end. So, I, you know, I I did love all of your stories in this book. I mean, I think everybody, anyone who's a re, as a writer or a reader, I mean, as a reader, I enjoyed it because even when I'm reading a book right now, and I kept going back to these with what the book that I'm reading. And I was like, did it accomplish that? Did it, you know, what was the idea for this book? Whether, and I read a lot of books that are also, um, you know, historical fiction. Okay. So you have to take somebody, which you do talk about too, is like to take um, somebody's story and then put it into a movie or a book, which is also its own challenge, right? It is. And sometimes, you know, writing true story adaptations, which I'm, you know, best known for the, the two miniseries you mentioned wasn't what I came into the business to do, but I, I was got the lucky break that Tom Hanks asked me to, to work on those you know, for him. Uh, it's, it's actually harder in some ways, even though you have that true story as your kind of crutch, because the history doesn't, history doesn't equal story. You know, story is a kind of manipulated dramatic structure that a writer imposes on something and if you're limited by what really happened it makes your job harder in some ways uh because you can't just you know make it whatever you want and you tend to want to just lean on the research and feel like well the true thing that happened that is the story i just have to deliver what really happened there's a lot more that goes into it than that in terms of writer needing to find their take on it and find the story they're going to tell from that history, inspired by that history, taken out of that history, and you have to apply all the same criteria you'd apply to a fictional piece, uh, but without the liberty of making up whatever you want. Well, and I loved you when you were talking about the characters that we love and then how flawed they are. And I'll let you talk about, like, Liar Liar and, and Tony Soprano. I mean, I didn't even realize <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, Tony Soprano is kind of obvious, but in Liar Liar with Jim Carrey, I didn't even realize that they had gotten us to like him before. <laughs> <laughs> and then I went back to the beginning of the movie, and I was like, yeah, they did. Like, we did like him. Like, we were rooting for him, even though he was such a jerk, right? Yeah. I mean, they, they, my point there was I was talking in the book about how uh, one big problem I see in a lot of scripts is when writers – are writing about a main character who's not a very good person at the beginning of the movie and, and is going to be a better person at the end. Um, and I think that that can be a trap. That can be a, that can be a challenge if you make your main character kind of a jerk at the beginning of the movie. The audience may not want to follow them, may not care enough to invest in the story. You know, it's like Blake Snyder's book, Save the Cat. The premise mm-hmm. was, as a, kind of half-jokingly, your main character needs to save a cat in the opening scenes or do something else selfless, you know, self-sacrificing and just lovable to make the audience get on their side. And people today tend to, you know, tends to be out of vogue to make your characters really likable. Um, but my point is in virtually every successful story, if you really look at it closely, the main character that we're meant to follow and sort of take on their perspective is lovable in some very specific ways. And it's very rare that they, that they start the movie an actual jerk. Uh, right. <laughs> liar Liar is an, is an exception to that. There's a few, like, you know, the a Christmas Carol, you know, Ebenezer Scrooge. There are a few, but, you know, both of those stories, if you look at them, the whole point of that story is the guy starts as a jerk, and then a magical event is going to happen that's going to, you know, beat the crap out of them for the rest of the story and cause them to stop being a jerk in the end. Uh, right. But even in that, even in Liar Liar, like you said, he really loves his kid and is great with his kid when he shows up. And he's also super entertaining to watch. So <laughs> right. you, you sort of forgive somewhat if a character is super entertaining to watch. Or I use the example of the TV series How MD, how he was an unlikable character, but he was saving lives every week. And is also very entertaining to watch. So you, you don't love how he treats people, but you're invested enough because of those factors. 
So yeah, I, I also yeah. love your example of Mad Men too, because I'm a huge Mad Men fan, and it's like you wouldn't want to watch, you know, like for everything that Don Draper isn't. Like, you know, but we, we don't care. Like, we're like, make excuses up for him. <laughs> we're like, yeah, he's, you know, he's not that faithful, but, you know, if you look at him. <laughs> you know? Well, I mean, with Mad Men, my, my feeling like the pilot of Mad Men, like most TV episodes, it has more than one story, more than one main character going right. on. So it has a Don Draper story in the pilot. Because I, I look at pilots because when you're creating a TV series, if you're trying to break into TV, you're basically writing a pilot script you know, a first episode that's an example of what a typical episode would be while also introducing the series. And in that series, in that pilot, I mean, Don Draper's not the most likable character, but what we focus on is his problem. He's having this problem at work, Mm -hmm. right? And some aspects of how he deals with the problem are not that sympathetic, but basically he's struggling. So he does have a problem. But moreover, we have this other character, Peggy, that balances him out by being incredibly lovable and having this, like, undeserved misfortune of having to be a woman secretary at a place like this and trying to figure out, you know, this incredible sexual harassment environment she now works in, how she's supposed to navigate that. So it's a combination, I think, likability of giving the characters big problems and, and or making them just lovable people. You need some combination of those two things. A lot of times people point to uh, Breaking Bad as a show mm-hmm. where the main character is, like, a, quote, bad guy. And I always say, well, by season five, but if you look at the pilot, Walter White was the most lovable guy on the planet Earth in that pilot. Mm-hmm. You know, they do all these things to make him lovable so that when he makes a decision to start cooking meth, we don't check out and say, screw <laughs> that guy, you know? <laughs> right. Oh, that's absolutely right. I think the TV writing, I don't know, the, what's your opinion? As opposed to writing, if a screenwriter's out there, you know, writing for a TV series or coming up with the concept, the idea, I guess, is you know, since we're talking about the idea, the idea for a TV show as opposed to the idea for a movie, a TV show has to be long-lasting, hopefully, right? I mean, so it's well, got to be. I don't yeah, know. <laughs> it's, uh, I would say that people sometimes think, well, a TV series is just one really long story. And I would say on some level, yes, but a more important way to think about it is that it's a container for an endless number of small stories, smaller stories, which are part of a larger story, because each episode has to have a beginning, middle, and end. And usually each episode of most TV series is going to have two, three, four, five or more stories in it. It's not going to have one main character with one story. You're going to be interweaving several different stories that have to resolve at the end of an episode, even while being part of a larger problem that can never fully resolve or the series would be over. So it kind of works on some other levels that you don't have to deal with when you're writing a feature film, where it's just one, usually one main character, one story, it's over at the end, period, you're done. Right. Yeah, I, I guess I wouldn't, and especially if you watch, if you, especially because of Netflix, and when you binge watch a show, yeah, I think you really get to see the writing, you know, as you're going through each season, and you're like, wait, how did they know? <laughs> and, then you're like, and then you're like, oh, they did know, like, if they got that far, if they got to season five, anyway, it's like, it builds into that, um, you know, however long it goes, but usually by, you know, season five, you're like, oh, wait, if you go back to season one, you can actually almost see it coming into season five, right? Uh-huh. Yeah, there's a lot of planning that goes into that. It's not always planned way in advance. Sometimes it's planned, you know, one year at a time or roughly planned at the beginning, but then figured out as you go along. Because, you know, it's kind of hubris to go into that whole thing even thinking you're going to have five seasons because that's <laughs> a one in a million, you know, show that is that successful. So, you know, you may have the first season mapped out um, beyond the pilot and the rest I think is often a little bit sketchy you know, to be determined later. Right. Do you you feel like the movie industry for screenwriters has changed now that there are so many outlets, though, for not just, like, the big screen, but then also, you know, Netflix and Amazon and, you know, Hulu? And, I mean, do do you think it's getting easier for them? Or, I don't know. What is your concern? No, it's it's not getting easier, I don't think. It's getting – the one way in which it's getting easier is if you're already a proven commodity in television – who, who's already quite successful as a writer, you now have more outlets to, to sell your work to in television. And you have more freedom to do different kinds of material than there was before. 
But if you're not an established writer, I don't think it's any easier uh, because, you know, the way TV has changed with, you know, the Amazon and the Netflix and so forth, a lot of it is in the direction of smaller series orders, less money from a professional standpoint, from a breaking right. in to the business standpoint. Fewer jobs per show, fewer, less money, uh, fewer mm-hmm. writers. Uh, well, that's the same thing. Fewer writers on each show, but also fewer episodes produced each season. So it's not like there's a net gain in, in employment options when you're breaking in. I don't really think because the network side has, has sort of contracted and dried up a bit, uh, while this other side has grown. So it's right. attractive if you can sell a show, but most, you know, shows that get sold are by established writers virtually always. Unless, you know, maybe some new writer teamed up with an established writer to get something made, but most time it's established writers. Uh, and that's who now has more places to go with their projects. Uh, and even they may not make as much money because there aren't as much residual. I was just reading an article today in Fast Company about this, how middle class in Hollywood drying up in certain ways. They use a lot of examples of writers and TV writers and how, you know, there's not as much money flowing freely around as there used to be. There is in terms of production. Uh, with Netflix making all these shows, for instance, but there's not in terms of, you know, writer's salaries and writers being able to, A, break in and, B, maintain a kind of middle-class existence by working in television. If you're a showrunner, creator of shows who's successful, yes, but it's always great for those people. <laughs> for the others, it's still it's still tough. Yeah, that's what I mean. It's such a, it seems like it is such a tough industry to break into, um, you know, because you say to be a seasoned writer, well, you've got to actually get there to be the seat. Like, <laughs> you actually yeah. have to do the work to get there to be that person. And, and you did have a, you know, you had a great break in your career, yeah. which, you know, I think that that's also part of it. I mean, even for actors and actresses, anybody in that industry, you know, the, the, you do keep working until you get that. It's almost like you work until you get your break, right? Yeah, you just have to keep at it. Yeah, for and, sure. And which I I love the last um, couple sentences in this book, uh, and I actually quoted this to my son who is a golfer, and because I think this is for anybody. <laughs> and and you say so. My advice is to stop wondering if you have it or not. Take that out of the equation. You have it. What makes you one of the special ones who succeed is what you do with it. And I was like, when I got done with that, I'm like, oh, my gosh, that's for everything, isn't it? It's just everything that, that anybody wants to work at, any dream you have. It's what you do with it. Yeah, I mean, that's under the section title, Talent is Overrated, you know, and it was based on a uh, speech Akiva Goldsman, Academy Award-winning screenwriter for Beautiful Mind, gave at a Writers Guild mm-hmm. strike rally uh, in 2008 uh, where he said, everyone always told me I wasn't a very good writer and I just never stopped, you know? Mm-hmm. So eventually he became quote talented, you know, he became successful. So uh, it's not about innate ability. I mean, some people, yeah, have more, have an easier time developing more quickly for sure. It's not that anyone can be successful at this. It's that if you're asking yourself, am I one of the special few that has it or not? That's the wrong question. It's mm-hmm. more, what do I do with whatever it is I do have? With my passion and interest in doing this, how do I just keep moving forward? Of course, the success is never guaranteed, but uh, at least seeing yourself as capable, but a lot to learn and grow through probably, as opposed to, well, some people have it and some don't. Right. I, I, I love that. It was, a, it was a perfect way to end this book. But well, thank you. Um, for everybody out there, before I let you go, like if you give a lot of great examples on how you come up with ideas. I mean, because this is about ideas and, you know, a lot of people think, you know, even authors who are writing books, any anybody who's creative in that way, and they're like, I just don't have that idea. I remember when I was talking to Mark T. Sullivan when he, he was talking about his book and the idea, and, you know, he was like praying for an idea, and he came up with this one concept, and it was like, oh, my God, this is it. Like, you know, and it's like, how how do you work on your ideas? Well, the idea generating process is very different from the kind of analytical process where you're looking and saying, does my idea fit all these criteria? You know, the book presents a process or a set of, you know, elements that you're trying to make sure your story has. But in the last chapter, I kind of turn away from that analytical side and talk about generating ideas, as you said, which is more of a, some people would call it like right brain versus left brain process, you know, where you have to be kind of receptive 
you know, ideas don't come out of critical analytical thinking. They come out of some kind of more relaxed, playful, peaceful kind of mindset, it seems like. That's when good ideas come. Uh, or, you know, you ask a question, you know, what would this character want at this point in the story? And then you kind of like get an answer. That's an idea that comes. Uh, when you get too constricted analytical, it seems to me ideas don't tend to flow as well. So a lot of it is about kind of managing your emotional state or like where your mind is at. And if you're in the process of needing ideas, which most of the writing process, you're needing ideas to be flowing on any given day. That's what you're doing is you're kind of ideas are coming and then you're like writing them down, playing with them, organizing them, critiquing them and revising them as well. But you need the idea, first of all, the constant flow of them, macro ideas about what a story should be about and micro ideas about the current scene and what would he say in response to what she said or whatever. So it's a lot about the mindset, but in terms of generating ideas for stories, I talked about in the book a process I used for keeping track of different things that interest me in the world, different things that I think could one day be part of a story I'd be interested in writing, whether it's types of characters, professions, arenas, settings, fantastical concepts, things I see in other movies, TV, books, whatever, just kind of like being a sponge and noticing what I'm interested in, what I'm, what I'm obsessed with, what I would want to explore more, and I'm kind of like keeping this master list of all these different things. And then when it's time to like generate ideas, find ideas for stories to write, I have a process where I take items from these different lists and I try to match them up together and say, if I had to write a story about, you know, th these two things thrown together, you know, uh, baseball and child <laughs> adoption, you know, whatever, <laughs> two things that are on my list, what would I come up with? And I give myself like a very short amount of time to just go, okay, I've got five minutes. What would I come up with? Is there anything there? And, and, uh, and then I move on to the next item on the list. And then, you know, ideas have come because I'm sort of, you know, forcing the process. I'm going outside my, in a way, my rational mind and just saying, I'm brainstorming. I'm just saying, whatever comes, comes. If nothing comes, fine, I'll move on. And in a very short period of time, I have found I can generate some basic ideas or sort of mini log lines of potential story situations and just add them to a long list that one day I'll go back through the list and find ones that I really might want to develop. Yeah, I love that. I love Because I was like, right, because if you think about the movies, that have been out there and the examples that you give, like, you're like, oh, right, it was just an idea. It was just the beginning of an idea, in the, you know, and then, like, what would happen if, and then all of a sudden it's a movie, you know, like in Big, or, like, you know, it's like what would happen if, and then all of a sudden yeah. there you go, you know? Yeah, 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 yeah. what that. if? Yeah, Yo. so anyway, what, what's your current favorite movie right now? Do you have one? My current favorite movie that's out right now, um, yeah. I'm trying to think what I've seen lately that I really, really like. I did a blog post on Set It Up, which is a Netflix movie, a romantic comedy. That's been a couple of months now that I actually thought was quite good. I'm trying to think there's probably been something I liked a lot since then. There have been things I didn't like as much as most people. I won't mention those. <laughs> <laughs> well, I tell you what, I'm looking forward to the Freddie Mercury movie, Bohemian Rhapsody, that's coming yeah. out. You My know, friend so Dexter Fletcher directed or, or finished the directing of that movie. He was an actor in Band of Brothers, Dexter Fletcher. Oh, that's awesome. Well, I didn't know that. That's awesome. I mean, I see movies that I'm looking for, like Creed 2. I'm looking forward to that. That's coming uh -huh. up over Thanksgiving. And, you know, sometimes they're big ones, like that one is a pretty big one with, you know, Sylvester Stallone. And, but, you know, but the Bohemian Rhapsody, I mean, there we took Freddie Mercury. That's why I can't wait to see what they did with it. And, you know because everybody loved him. <laughs> yeah. So I, and, of course, because it's music, and oh, I, I'm imagining it's going to be amazing. So I can't wait for that one. But, um, you know, I don't – I tend – I used to go to all the um, the Marvel and DC comics with my son. I don't really do that anymore that, now that they don't they, – or they go with their friends now. They don't go with me. But, you know, those were always the off popular ones for right, you know, this last couple of years were always those. So, you know. But I kind of look for the other ones that have more story, like you yeah. know, quieter, quieter. 
not uh-huh. so much access, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but, well, anyway, thank you so much, Eric. This has been so much fun. And everybody, go out and get this book. I mean, like I said, readers, writers, it's a, as a reader, I got so much from it. And it made me think about the movies and, and the books that I love so much. So um, I will have the Amazon link listed below. You can get it now. And I will also have your uh, website, which I love so much. It's it's always a good website. You know, you keep it up. You write a lot of blogs, and it's great. Well, thank you, Michelle. It's great to be with you again, and I'm glad that you like the book, and hopefully others who hear this will benefit from it. Yeah, so you have a great day. Thanks, Eric. You too. Thanks. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. all for listening to my interview with Eric. I hope he helped you as much as he helped me. I told you I know what I'm going to write about, but reading this book has really helped me with thinking about my idea and how I want to structure it and if it's worth anything. And um, he gave me a lot to think about. So go get this book. I'm going to have the Amazon link listed below along with his website. He has an amazing website. So thank you so much, Eric. I love talking with you. Everyone have a great day.